thanks a lot for having me on short notice. Uh, so this is a paper not really about identity. I have a paper on identity, but it's with Jean-Paul, and he didn't want me to present it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm presenting something that's only peripherally about identity. It's about leadership uh, and social norms. And it's primarily, an well, it's, it's entirely an empirical paper, and it's an economic history paper about um, the influence of a well-defined, relatively small set of leaders on uh, volunteering in the Civil War from 1861 to 65. Nothing happening there? OK. Yeah. Uh, so what's interesting, um, or, or, or an interesting way to motivate our paper is from this leadership angle. And what's kind of interesting when you, when you read about leadership is that there's these two kinds of literatures that are sort of very, sort of very uh, distinct or bifurcated. There's a very well-established empirical literature showing that leaders matter inside organizations. So we know that leaders matter, uh, political leaders matter, uh, CEOs in companies <coughs> matter. Those are well-identified findings that we understand quite well. And there's also a theoretical literature that goes with that that sort of talks about leadership characteristics, things like resoluteness, um, persuasion, communication skills that make better leaders or worse leaders. So that's one literature. And then there's a separate literature, which is about leadership outside of organizations. And that's an entirely theoretical literature. So there's a sort of a, a fair amount of papers. And, and Robbie's Movers and Shakers paper is one of them um, that show that just like in, in social networks where um, you, you don't have anyone being sort of predefined as a leader by their organizational or institutional affiliation, nonetheless, leadership will arise in network settings. And this could be without these leaders having any characteristics that make them special at all. So that's the case of the Goyal AR paper, where it's just the feature of the network that generates, that generates leaders, so to speak. Or it could be that certain people just have leadership assigned to them. And then by virtue of them knowing about themselves that they're more prominent, they know that they're going to lead by example. They know that their actions leave an imprint on, on the network, and that makes them act differently. And that's the case of the Asimoglu Jackson paper, where uh, visible or prominent agents are not really in any, uh, in any don't have any different characteristics. They're, they're, they're just people who are endowed with visibility. And the fact that they're endowed with the visibility makes them change their behavior because they know that they're going to influence the, they, they internalize part of their part of the network's response to their actions. So this could be like just like someone becomes a martyr by, by historical circumstance, and that changes how they act. And then, and then in Robbie's work, uh, you, you, you take more seriously the notion that people actually vary in their characteristics and that make them leaders in networks, and then, and then study um, what that does. Now, we're, we're not going to, unfortunately, really be able to sort of speak to those details. So like we're not going to be able to distinguish in our setting whether the leaders we have um, exactly what characteristics make them leaders, we don't know enough about them. We're not able to statistically distinguish that. But we will be what we think the first empirical paper to just show leadership in a just social network without any organizational institutional affiliation. So in other words, you just like treat a, a social network, that's society, uh, with, with leaders and you know exactly what these leaders care about and then you know exactly what kinds of outcomes they um, should want to influence, and then you just you just test for an effect. And, and the reason that that's challenging and the reason that there isn't really a paper like that yet is that it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to think of an exogenous treatment with leaders. So you might think of all sorts of people like Cesar Chavez or Gandhi or the Beatles as leaders in their respective spheres, but you don't really know are they just symbols of change or are they drivers of change. It's very difficult to say. Uh, it's very difficult to know what kind of outcome to study most of the time when you have like a, sort of like a disparate set of you know people you can think of who might be social leaders, um, but they care about different things, and it's very often confounded by organizational leadership. So, for instance, I, I think of uh, Abraham Lincoln as a civic leader, but he was also the president of the United States, and so it, it just makes it difficult to sort of say the, the the effect that we see of a person, even if you could identify them, are sort of civic leadership effects. And so what we have, what we work with, is, is, a, um, is, is something that has really a strong flavor of a natural experiment, which is um, the failed revolutions in Germany of 1848, which were revolutions for a democratic and more liberal organization of society, and also for a unified German nation state, which sort of ends up sort of mapping a little bit into a preference against secession in the US. But more, more centrally, it's about democracy and liberalism. 
And, and so these revolutions fail in Germany. And then these German guys all get uh, kicked out into Switzerland. And then they sit there for about a half a year. And then very suddenly, there's this culmination of political pressure that forces the Swiss authorities to kick them out of Switzerland. And they all end up in the US. Okay? And so we basically just coded up these individuals, um, tracked where they locate, coded up their biographies in the US, tracked where they located in the US. And then we look at their effects in the US. And what's nice about that is that they sort of arrive in the US with this pre ex ante defined label of being a civic leader in the sphere already attached to them when they, when they um, at their port of arrival, because the things that they fought for in Germany are exactly the reason that they show up in New York, and the things that they fought for in Germany map very cleanly into the political struggles in the US at the time about free soil slavery and anti-Southern uh, secession. Uh, and so we, the, the informal definition, of course, um, or oh, maybe not of course, you'll see that the informal decision is still has sort of like a, it's not, it's not that algorithmic when you actually code who is a 48er, but the implicit, the implicit sort of definition of a 48er is a person who in some way actually participated in the revolutions in Germany, had to leave their homes because of this. For the most part, they were just told, if you don't leave, we're going to imprison you. Um, and, um, and that's more or less this. And that's why they arrived in the US. And, um, what did these guys care about? So, 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 Zucker, who's like the main um, historian of them, the, the main, the main biographist of, of 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 their lives, defines them as political beings who, intellectual speaking, intellectually speaking, uh, were defined by three aspects: uh, liberty, democracy, and national unity. And so, in a, in a, in a sense, it just so happens that these are the three things that were going on in the U.S. at the time. The three big political struggles in the U.S at the time are free soilism, anti-slavery, and national unity. So there's a really clean mapping into, from what these guys fought for and, and struggled for in Germany into um, the political struggles in the US at the time. And uh, we considered many outcomes, and I'm going to show you a number of interesting outcomes. But our, our primary outcome, our main outcome, is their influence on men enlisting in the Union Army uh, during the Civil War, so from 1861. Um, to 65. And what's nice about that outcome is it's very costly. It's a very, so to the extent that we think these 48ers influenced the social norms in the society that they arrived in, and we, we think of this as a very local form of influence. So they settle in a town, and you're going to see that for the most part these are small rural towns that these 48ers settled in, and then they have an influence on the social norms in their local community. That's how we think of them. And so when, when you talk about that, you want something tangible, something meaningful to measure social, social norms or convictions. And so volunteering to fight in a war that is a very costly war, the costliest war in US history, is sort of, in, from that perspective, is a nice, nice outcome to be studying. Um, I'm going to be ne necessarily short on background. I'm going to tell you very little about what they actually did in Germany. So let's just say they fought for national unity, democracy, and liberty. Um, this is Germany. Right here, they tried to found a parliament in Frankfurt, which is my hometown. Uh, they wanted to institute a constitutional monarchy. At the very last minute, the king of Prussia refused to become emperor of a unified Germany uh, elected by the people. So he, he, he refused to be elected by the riffraff. So the whole thing fell apart. And then they, they sort of get broomed out into Switzerland. And then they sit around in Switzerland for a half year. And then about a half a year to a year later, they're basically being told by the Swiss, Swiss authorities, hey, look, we're getting a lot of pressure from the German and the French authorities. You're going to go to prison if you don't leave. And so then they all leave Switzerland. And then, so this is the French king pointing them uh, towards the boats. And then they leave Europe for American shores. And then they arrive in the US. And you're going to see they arrive in a very, very narrow uh, time window of like two years. Some of them take a detour. Uh, maybe spend a couple of months in Le Havre. Some of them take a detour, spend a couple of months in London. But for the most part, they arrive in a very narrow two-year time window in the US. Um, this is one of the more prominent. Not, not many of these are particularly well known. Karl Schurz is the most well known because he becomes Secretary of War under Lincoln at some point. But that's like, <laughs> that's like a complete outlier. For the most part, they were prominent locally, but not, not nationally or even statewide. Uh, this is one of the more prominent of them. Uh, he fought in, uh, in Germany, so there, he was engaged in military battles in Germany in 48, uh, got kicked out, spent some time in Switzerland, had to leave Switzerland, uh, spent about a half year in London, and then ended up uh, in the US. 
ended up settling in Missouri. And then when the Civil War kicked, out, uh, kicked, uh, kicked off, that's the wrong term, broke out, um, he recruited his own regiment. So, so Civil War enlistment happened typically at the regiment level, which is a, a thousand men. And if you were a prominent local person, you would try to raise a regiment. So many regiments were raised by the local mayor or the, the local uh, school principal. So it was a very sort of localized phenomenon. And he's one of those that actually raised their own Union Army regiment, which made him a corporal in the, in the Union Army. And then after the war, he was prominent in newspapers. And this is something that we see more typically. A lot of these guys um, selected themselves into <coughs> journalistic publishing um, pr professions uh, once they were in the US. Here's another one. Here's one that didn't fight in, in the US. Um, he also didn't fight in Germany militarily, but he was politically engaged enough that he had to, he was forced to leave Germany. Didn't, he went directly from Germany to the US. Um, one of the things that is nice for us from an identification per, uh, perspective is a lot of these guys were kind of poor and disorganized when they arrived. Which, which gives us a little bit of that historical thing. We're going we're gonna to throw a whole bunch of statistical machinery at that, but from a sort of historical narrative perspective, we have the strong flavor of this haphazard form of arrival. They sort of, they, there's no planning, there's lo, no like social networks when they arrive. They just, they have to leave short notice. They arrive in New York, they more or less don't know anyone, and then they take it from there. And one, one way in which that shows up is that many of them were just very poor and took on these manual occupations upon arrival, and then they sort of slowly reconverge to the sort of more white collar intellectual type of occupation or 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 even in the, in their in their private time preoccupation that that they were engaged with in in Europe and so he became a newspaper editor in several newspapers and became very influential or at least that's what his biographers say uh, in the anti-slavery cause and so one way in which these 48ers shape public opinion is just by by being very vocal about them so this is a quote from from Carl Schurz three years before the outbreak of the war, so before the Republicans won the, won, won the presidential election. It's just a, a long quote, um, basically ranting against the Democratic Party for, uh, for favoring slavery. And so these guys were very um, vocal in and influential in supporting the Republican Party and its rise as well. We're less focused on that in our outcomes because you can't get sub-county uh, voting data. So we have some county level voting data that certainly suggests these guys were influential in the rise of the Republican Party, but we're focused, we, from a statistical point of view, we want to focus on towns and you can't get town level voting data. So it's like, that's all in the appendix. That's not the core of our paper, but they seem to have been influential in the, in the rise of the Republican Party for sure. Um, and they were also very active in the sort of like grassroots organization. And the primary way in which we can measure this is engagement in these so-called Turner societies, which were originally gymnastic organizations formed in Germany in the 1920s, but then in the wake of the 1948 revolutions became these political organizations. And then when the first one was founded in the US in 1849, they were these really political organizations. And so they became very influential in the Civil War. There were entire regiments that were just formed out of Turner societies that came to be known as Turner regiments. Uh, they formed bodyguards for Lincoln during the presidential elections. Back then it was still common for people to just get beaten up on the campaign trail and stuff like that. So it was a, you know, it was a more rambunctious time. And um, yeah, and then there's another quote that we don't have time to read because it's a short format today. Um, our outcome or our, our focus is on towns. And the reason that we really wanted to focus on towns is almost all American economic history or American um, quantitative history that you see in this time is focused at the county level because most things are published at the county level. But when we think of local communities in the 1850s, 1860s in the US, we really think about towns. And so it's actually quite a challenge to even know what are the towns in the US in 1850, 1860s. It's difficult to know. And in 1840 and in 1870, you actually kind of don't know because the census didn't publish any town level data. We got lucky or fortuitously in 1850 and 1860, in those two decades, the census decided, for whatever reason, to publish a town-level data set with some rudimentary demographic characteristics. Um, but, but the main thing is not so much even the characteristics, but just having a data set that tells you what are the towns in the United States in 1850, because it's, it's kind of hard to know otherwise. And so luckily, we have this for, for, for the years that we focus on. Um, We've, we have a core sample of about 7,300 towns, and that shrinks down to a sample of 4,500 towns because our main outcome, Union Army enlistments, in some states, you don't get enlistment data at the town level. 
And because we're going to weight all of our regressions by their natural measure of quality, which is the share of enlisted people that we can directly measure to be uh, enlisted in the town, as opposed to allocating them through various other ways that we describe in the paper, we end up with a core sample of 4,400 observations, which are the 4,000 towns where we can actually have enlistment data at the town level from, from, from the data source we use, which I'm going to talk about uh, in a second. So unlike a couple of other papers about immigration that are sort of occurring at, in a similar time period, mm, what we have is we really focus in on a well-defined set of individuals, okay? Now, because these guys don't have an organizational or institutional affiliation per se, while there's this sort of implicit definition, which sounds very precise, that they're the people who had to leave Europe because of their involvement in the 48 revolutions and then arrived in the US, that, that sounds like a precise definition, but it's actually not a very precise definition, right? So in the, at the end, what you do is you read all the history books and you code up all the people that get mentioned as being 48ers, because there is no well-defined definition of what is a 48er from, from, a, from an actual measurement or data perspective. So that's what we do. We code up the four books that there are that sort of are directly biographical accounts of the 48ers, and, and we end up with about 500 guys uh, and, and really it's just a game of saying these are the 500 people that were important enough to have been mentioned by the historians as being the 48ers. And these historians themselves say there is no clear definition of a 48er. So Zucker says maybe there's up to 2,000 48ers, who knows. I would, he says in a quote in his book, up to 2,000 would be plenty to cover all the leaders and their minor followers, whatever that means. Okay? But we end up with 500 people. But one concern in our empirics is that we end up with these 500 well-defined people, we locate them in the US, but maybe they're just the tip of the iceberg of a wave of Germans arriving at the same time who are all sort of infected by this revolutionary spark who co-locate with the 500. And so the way that we address that is that we code up all the Germans from all the shipping lists in the US who arrive from 49 to 50 and then locate them in the US census in 1860 to have a measure of the co-movement of all Germans who are arriving around the same time as the 48ers. And sure enough, that thing correlates quite heavily with the 48ers, which tells us in part they went where other Germans around the time, same time also went, but there's enough residual variation to, to, to get identification out of that. And then our treatment in words is simply did a 48er settle in your town? Okay. When we actually implement it, it's a little bit more complicated because these guys moved around a little bit. Maybe the, uh, a person arrived in 49, another person arrived in 51. We want to allow that to matter a little bit. So, so the actual measure we use is sort of like a year-weighted uh, treatment that is exactly equal to one, normalized to be equal to one if a single 48er was in a town for the 10 years from 1850 to 1860. And if, it's, if the measure is two, then that could be two, year, two 48ers uh, in those 10 years, or it could in principle be four 48ers uh, for five years each. But as, a, as an empirical matter, as a data matter, for the most part, these guys settled in one place, and then they stayed there up to the Civil War. So, for, so all of them, almost all of them arrived in New York, a handful of them arrived in Baltimore, and then from there, they sort of spread out into the countryside for the, for the most part. Um, okay, I'm going to have to be a little bit disciplined with, I, don't, I can't tell you too many details about the data. Three mechanisms that we want to consider, one of which is almost like a placebo mechanism, if you like, is one of them is we want to look at the foundation of tone of society. So if we believe that these guys had an, in, and, and, and when I say guys, you know, it's, it's uh, 493 48ers, 491 of them are guys. So I'll just say guys. Um, the, but one of the two females is, uh, was the founder of the first kindergarten in the US. So she was also influential, but uh, possibly not so influential for, for volunteering in the, in the Civil War. Or maybe she was, we can't distinguish that. Um, so one of the mechanisms is that we think these local grassroots organizations were important. Uh, we don't know exactly what was happening inside of those organizations, but at least we can look at their founding, okay? And so that's gonna be one mechanism outcome. And then we know that um, they were very vocal in the press. Also in English, not only in, not, only in, uh, not only in German, also in English, but more so in German than in English. And so we separately coded up um, the, the local town level circulation prevalence of German newspapers and US newspapers controlling for initial uh, newspapers, so before the 18, uh, before the 48ers arrival. And so 
This is just a pretty picture that uh, satisfies two functions. The first one is the solid line is the 48ers arrival in the US and what it shows you very nicely is this sort of like very narrow time window in which they arrive. So they all arrive in two, basically in two years and the reason is that they're getting kicked out. So they, they you know, they're kind of, they don't have a lot of choice about the timing of their arrival. Uh, the other one is one of the mechanisms which is the uh, number of Turner societies in the US and you can just see, I mean this are, these are just two aggregate time series so there's no claim to causality here but you know certainly Certainly, it looks like they may have caused, or may they may have contributed to the founding of 48ers, at least uh, of the of the Turner societies. At least the data would be consistent with that. This is the same picture, the same uh, uh, solid line for German newspapers. So there, the jump is less less steep, unsurprisingly, because there's already a base of 200 German newspapers in the U.S. before the 48ers arrive. But certainly, it's possible, at least from this aggregate time series, that the 48ers contributed to to the to the de local density of German newspapers. And the anecdote certainly suggests that. Okay, so the key concern with, with identification is selective location. So what if the 48ers located themselves in, in, into towns where maybe the political climate was already turning against slavery, or maybe they were just co-locating with a ton of other Germans and it's really the mass of these, you know, or a ton of other immigrants or other things could be uh, happening at the same time. And so we just, there's just a lot to be controlled for because we don't have a natural uh, experiment in the sense uh, in the local sense. So we don't have an instrument for like instrumenting um, the, 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 the location of these individuals in towns. So um, what we do is first we appeal to the historical narrative. And the historical narrative tells us because these guys arrived in such a haphazard way, there was just, they arrived with very little connections compared to other immigrants at the time. So in other words, they just arrived, they arrived in New York and they more or less just went to the German society in New York and said, go find me work, because they were poor. And so there's this beautiful quote, I couldn't have written it better if I had to make it up, um, by the German society in New York saying that in 1850-51 there was a sudden steep increase in requests for assistance to people totally deprived of all means, mostly political refugees flocking to America after the failure of the revolution. And so this is a, this is a quote from the German Society of New York about German immigrants. And so this is kind of like exactly making this point that these guys arrived, they're, they're um, well-educated intellectual people in Germany, people of means, but they arrive in, the, in New York not as people of means. And so what happens is that the uh, German Society of New York gets them jobs and for the most part they get them uh, jobs in Kansas, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, out there close to what at this time is the frontier where, where the jobs are. Um, that does also mean that they co-locate with a bunch of other immigrants. And so, and so this is something that statistically we need to worry about. So, so there's a sense of exogeneity here from a statistical point of view in terms of where they go, but it also applies to a bunch of other immigrants arriving at the same time. And so that's sort of like the main, the main identification worry we have. This is a map of the US at the time, everything west of uh, the Mississippi isn't really in state form yet, with the exception of California. And uh, um, blue is canals and rivers, red is the railroad, and then the black nodes are 48er locations, and size of node is the number of 48ers. And so one additional um, challenge that we have in our data is that not only do you only have 450 guys that locate themselves in 80 cities, they also do so in a highly skewed way. So there's a very, there's a sizable number of towns, about 30 or 40, that get one or two 48ers, but then there are seven or eight towns, like Cincinnati, that get 15 to 20 48ers, and then there's New York, which is a crazy outlier, which gets 140 48ers, because if 95% of your German immigrants at the time all arrive in New York, of course a substantial par portion of them is gonna stay in New York. So we're just gonna ignore New York, because there, there's no point even trying to grab that with a linear approximation. Uh, we will in some specifications ignore the seven or eight other large cities and in others we will not ignore them. We will see that it has zero um, bearance on significance but it does of course affect the estimated size of the coefficient because you're trying to force a linear line through these outliers far out there. So it, it affects the magnitudes we're estimating but not, not the qualitative insight. This is actually a cutoff um, line of uh, all the towns that are treated. And so you can see New York City is the big outlier here. It has 123 48ers. Cincinnati is the other big outlier, but there is a couple more. The big cutoff is actually 
that there's a, a large number of towns with one, two or three 48ers and then there's a jump from Washington DC which has six to Belleville with eight and then Cleveland with nine. And so that's the cutoff where we call towns with many 48ers that in the baseline we ignore, but adding them actually doesn't weaken our results at all. It just changes estimated coefficients. Then we go through a whole hoop of, um, of, of you know, matching procedures and controlling for stuff. The, the essential insight is there's plenty of things that correlate in univariate regressions with their location, but there's a sort of a set of core controls which is German networks in a town in 1850, the change in that from the 1850 to 1860 census, which actually turns out not to be a strong predictor, the size of a town uh, turns out to matter when it's not squared. Um, and then this is the specific German arrival cohort that we coded from shipping lists from 49 to 52, and then mapped them into space uh, in, in the 1860 census. And they are quite predictive of these 48ers arriving. And then there's the sixth thing, which is a map that was circulated in Germany at the time that basically had all the potential towns that Germans might want to go to. So this is basically the thing that you hold in your hand as a German entering a ship in Hamburg or Bremen going to the US. You got this map in your hand and you're thinking, okay, am I gonna go to Cleveland? Am I gonna go to Milwaukee? And so uh, we digitized that and just calculated distance to that and that's predictive in the manner that you would expect. What's interesting is once we control for those, those things all, everything else becomes highly balanced. So these are all p-values and there's a ton of p-values that are only marginally insignificant. So there's a ton, a ton of like 15, 0 0.15s, 0 0.14s that you see in here. So things that don't show up with stars, but they're pretty close to significant. And all of that just gets blown out the water once you condition on this sort of core set of controls, which at a first pass tells us the one selection we care about is this co-location with other Germans, and then to a lesser extent, just a bit of a preference for larger towns, okay? And then when we do matching estimators, we get balancedness even in that, okay? So this is a propensity score matched sample, which is a much smaller sample, which got cut off here, unfortunately, at the bottom. Uh, then we can achieve balances balancedness even in the core controls, okay? And so this is our basic identification approach in this paper. It's just we're gonna match and control the hell out of this thing uh, because we don't have an instrument. And, and that seems to work very well, as you're gonna see in a moment. There, there's an overall sense of just tremendous robustness in the fact that we see. And so as a quick roadmap, uh, JP, I have 20, oh, Mike, you're in charge, 20? 12 more minutes. 12 more minutes, okay, I'll get there. Uh, so as a quick roadmap, I'm gonna show you five sets <laughs> well, ask, yeah. <laughs> I'm open to questions. Uh, uh, so, so five sets of results. The baseline results on, on enlistment, uh, results on mechanisms. Then I'm going to show you something that I think you might be interested in uh, on results by ancestry group. Uh, and then we're going to look at different leadership styles. So actually a lot to get through in the next 12 minutes. So the baseline result up there, very robust, controlling for all these different controls, is that having one 48er in your town increases per capita enlistment, per capita um, uh, relative to a male adult baseline, of course, by 20 men per 100. Now that seems like a large number, and it is a large number, but you have to bear in mind the Civil War had a very, very high rate of enlistment, very high participation rate. So the average participation rate at the town level is actually 21%. So on average, 21 out of 100 adult males in an average town in the US went and fought in the war, which by today's standards, you think about the Iraq war, is, is a mind-blowingly large number, but this is a civil war, right? And so our estimated coefficient is, 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 is exactly the mean, okay? And as you would expect, when we do it in log terms, we get about a 90% increase, which is consistent with getting this uh, average effect that roughly mirrors the mean. So down here is the exact same results in log terms. So 148er increases enlistment in a town by 90%. So no matter how you cut it, it's a large effect, uh, but it's also a large effect inside a world where there's just a large amount of enlistment. Um, yeah. yeah. So why do you, what is it, I mean, if you agree is the total population, not the total white population? Total male adult population. You can do total male white adult population. It makes very little difference because this is all northern towns. There's just not a lot of non-whites around. There's some, but not enough to matter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I, I generally like things to be in logs. But, but I think from an interpretational point of view, uh, 
this per capita thing is nice. So we always show both, and they always behave in similar ways. Um, mechanisms. So we have these three sets of mechanisms, and what we see is that 48ers have a very um, significant effect on a Turner society being founded. So that coefficient is telling us that having a 48er settle in your town raises the probability of having a Turner society be founded in that town by 14 to 15 percent, 14 to 16 percent. Okay, and most towns only get a single uh, Turner society. So Chicago and Pennsylvania are the only ones. Uh, Chicago and Philadelphia are the only ones with two. Um, they also have a very large effect on newspapers. Now, the newspaper effect is very difficult. It's difficult to interpret, right? It's more like a validity check. We would expect that, but partly it's just an occupational effect. So partly, well, these guys choose as their occupation to run newspapers, so that doesn't directly identify them as civic leaders. But given that all the historical narrative talks about them as partly leading through publishing and being vocal in the newspapers, we would at least want to see the significant effect on German newspapers. And we do see that. And then we get no effect on US newspapers, which you know, we didn't have strong prize. We certainly expected this effect to be smaller. We didn't necessarily expect it to be zero, because these guys did also write in English. Um, OK, now the, the set of results that I suspect might, might be most interesting to you is we wanted to look at this transmission by ancestry group. That was challenging because in the Civil War Union Army, in the Union Army data, there's nothing about ancestry group. So we had to train a machine learning algorithm on predicting names based on reported ancestry in the 1850 and 1860 census. And then we took that algorithm and applied it to our 2 million uh, Union Army soldiers to infer their ancestry. And then we put the, aggregated that back up to the town to get the number of German ancestry men enlisting divided by the number of German ancestry adult males in the town. Or if it's in log terms, then just controlling for the log of that. Um, and what we get is this pattern that I think is kind of pretty nifty. So, uh, so on, in the left column, we have Germans. Then we have uh, the ones that are predicted to be native born. And by the way, we can do this trying to parse out second generation. So we uh, trying to account for the fact that the training algorithm is one that really reports birthplace and not ancestry. And so we get a second generation German showing up as American. So we can retrain the algorithm to, to make a person who is very predicted to be German, but says they're American, we can retrain the algorithm to then make that person actually German. And that's a way to like grab the second generation immigrants. But it ended up not mattering. It ended up changing almost nothing. Uh, so I just wanted to mention that we've done that. And so we get this um, ranking here of Germans, native, Irish, so the two English-speaking groups. And then we get the two largest non-English-speaking immigrant groups, Scandinavian men and Irish and Italian men. And you get this sort of very neat uh, ranking where the effect of a 48er on the Germans is about 100% or 95% increase in enlistments in German ancestry men in a town. You get about a 70% increase in enlistments of native and Irish ancestry men. And you get about a 50% increase in Scandinavian ancestry men. And you get about the same number, but very insignificant. And when you include all the controls, it goes to insignificant for Italian men. And so that's just kind of like an, a neat thing to be doing. And then we can use this ancestry stuff also just in the, in the, in the um, Union Army data directly in the way I'm going to show you in a moment. Uh, one thing that we were quite interested in is we have a lot of biographical information about these guys. And, and there's a lot of characteristics that theoretical leadership um, literature suggests might matter for leadership. Things like resoluteness, leading by sacrifice and leading by example. And so you might suspect a, na a naive, a very uninformed prior about these people would be that if you enlisted for the war yourself, you're leading by sacrifice, you're leading by example, and therefore you may have a stronger effect on enlistment. That's at least plausible. And so it turns out that 149 of our 548ers went and fought in the war themselves. Okay? And so we can code this, we can map them to their regiments and companies, and then we, we can just slice our 48er treatment into a slice treatment of the number of 48ers in a town that didn't enlist and the number of 48ers in town that enlisted. And then we got this surprising result which is that the effect of the men who didn't enlist is larger than the effect of the 48ers that did enlist. Okay? And then we wanted to dig deeper. The slicing is less clear when you do it in log terms. In log terms, it's sort of mixed. The coefficient on the 48ers who enlisted is actually larger but less significant. So you're kind of like, yeah, not really sure what to make of that. One thing that's really interesting is that we see that the effect of the 48ers on the Turner societies, on these grassroots organizations, is entirely, is entirely driven by the people who didn't enlist. 
Okay? And that's kind of interesting because when you read about their biographies, you get the sense that, well, a set of them are militarily trained people from Germany. Like they're the officer corps in Germany. They're the subset of German officers who decided to join the revolutions in Germany. And then they went to the US. And the bifurcation and who enlisted, who didn't enlist among the 48ers, these guys are in their early 50s at this point, right? It's not so much about commitment to the cause or leading by sacrifice. If you're a guy in your 50s with children and a wife, it's a pretty tall order for you to go and fight if you have zero military experience. So it's really about are you a militarily trained person, yes or no? That's what we believe. And the people who weren't militarily trained, they turned out to have a bigger effect on these local Turner societies. Okay? And we can do this nifty thing in the data to sort of validate this point. We can look at, well, what were you in the army? If you raised your own regiment, then you were a colonel, because colonels led regiments. If you were not a colonel, then you were a captain, which is the leader of a company, or you were a private. About 50 of the 149 were just privates. Two were musicians, a couple of them were surgeons. And so we, t we make a further distinction of these 149 into 48ers that enlisted and successfully raised their own regiments, and then the remain, and that's 40 of them, and the remaining 110 who didn't. And when we do that, what we see is that well, among the militarily trained who enlisted and the ones who sort of revealed the leadership characteristics necessary to raise their own regiment, they did have the biggest effect on local enlistment. They led to an increase in local enlistment of about 50 men per, per capita or 300%. Three, uh, and that's bigger than the effect of the men who didn't enlist. But it's mixed in, in this coefficient, with just the regular soldiers who enlisted but didn't have a particular effect, particular effect. Now there's plenty of room of interpretation here of exactly what that means. Is that maybe like a revealed leadership characteristic that only gets revealed for the subset of 48ers that actually enlisted? This is speculative. It's hard for us to know. But this pattern is sort of very consistent with the story that I just told you. Right? And so one last thing that we do we do is now we go from looking at, uh, at the, this whole thing at the town level to actually looking at the soldiers. And so we have over two million soldiers and we kick out all the ones who died and we kick out all the ones who got discharged from wounds, so the people who didn't have a chance to desert because they got killed or discharged. And we ask of the ones who didn't die or get discharged from wounds, how many deserted? And so there's this well-known set of papers by Dora Costa and Matthew Kahn looking at like group loyalty in the context of the Civil War. And the main outcome there is desertion. So the main question is, do you desert? And that's the same question that we ask for the 1.6 million men who did not die and who, do, who did not get discharged from disabling wounds that were severe enough that, that they um, could just um, unenlist from the army. And then we regress the decision to desert you know, whether, whether your tenure in the army got ended by desertion on a bunch of individual characteristics and group characteristics. In the main individual characteristic is what kind of a soldier are you? And so officers are systematically less likely to desert than privates. The omitted category is all the stuff in between, which is only about 10% of the soldiers. So the difference is about 8%, which is very consistent with the with uh, sort of like the history that you read about. And there's many practical reasons for that. It was just more difficult for an officer to just kind of like walk out of an army camp. And it was also just le less, less dangerous to be a soldier when you were an officer because back then it was still relatively uncommon to shoot at officers. So this isn't just all about like heroism manifesting itself in, in being an officer, but, but this is very consistent with the history. One minute. One interesting thing that we find, and this is very, so, and, and I, if I'd known I was going to present here, I would have emphasized this more. There's a big literature on mobilization and group loyalty in combat units. And what that literature concludes is that companies of 100 men are the fighting units. That's where your loyalty happens, that's where your group coherence happens. So what we do is we calculate up the share of soldiers at the company level who died and who, who got discharged from mortal wounds. And we look at that effect on the others, on the, ones who, on the ones who didn't. And we find that more people dying and more people being discharged from wounds raises the desertion rate of the remainder. When we do this at the regiment level, we get similar coefficients, but it's much weaker, which suggests to us, indeed, it's the company, not the regiment, that is the relevant sort of social unit in a war, which is just peripheral, really, to us, but it's interesting. Here we do the thing with the ancestry groups. 
every immigrant group is more likely to desert than the native group, which is again very consistent with what historians have said, but the Germans are the least likely to desert relative to the Scandinavians, Italians, and the Irish. Okay, more likely than the natives, but least likely than the others. Now, and then here we do this thing. These are the regiment leaders. These are the guys that are driving the enlistment effects. These are the 40 odd colonels that were the most successful at raising enlistment, right? But we already know regimental leaders, regiments are not the fighting units. It's companies that are the fighting units. So although the regiment leaders are the guys that drive the enlistment effect at the town, at the, when it comes to fighting, it's the company leaders, which is the captains of 100 men that have the biggest effect. So this is the treatment of being in a company where your captain is a 48er, and that significantly reduces your desertion rate, and so just it does just having a peer, a, a co-soldier, whatever the right term is, uh, in, in your company who's a 48er. So I guess I got lucky that I didn't get any questions. Thank you, Christian. Yeah. Thanks.